Hey, Vetfolio Voice family. In this episode... Okay, Cassie. I'm going to have to stop you right there. I love hearing you host Vetfolio Voice each week. You ask the best questions, and you have so much enthusiasm for veterinary medicine. But I'd love to hear more about you. I wanted to know what you're passionate about and what keeps you coming through those doors each day. And I bet all of you Vetfolio Voice listeners want to know about Dr. Cassie too. I'm Sam Sacasa, staff CVT here at Vetfolio, and I had the honor of putting Dr. Cassie in the hot seat to talk about her house call practice and why she decided to take on business ownership. What I discovered is Cassie is just as passionate about her clients as she is about her patients, and owning a house call practice, while challenging, has allowed Cassie to practice veterinary medicine in a way that's both exciting and so rewarding. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about the one and only Dr. Cassie. Dr. Cassie Fleming is a triple gator, earning her bachelor's and master's degrees in animal science, as well as her DVM degree from the University of Florida. While in vet school, Dr. Fleming earned certificates in veterinary business and food animal medicine. Despite originally planning to enter dairy practice after vet school, Dr. Fleming unexpectedly found her calling in small animal general practice. While she still loves all things cows, she greatly values the close relationship she has formed with her clients and their beloved pets. Dr. Fleming worked as an associate veterinarian for the first six years of her career before making the transition to business owner and taking on the role as Dr. Cassie staff veterinarian at NAVC's Vetfolio. In addition to her work in the continuing education field through Vetfolio, Dr. Fleming is the owner of Springs Veterinary Services, a small mobile general practice, and a part-time associate at Newberry Animal Hospital in Newberry, Florida, where she focuses primarily on dentistry in addition to general practice. Aside from her love of dentistry, Dr. Fleming is passionate about arthritis management and fostering and protecting the human-animal bond. With that, let's get to it. Cassie, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Um, this is this is a different experience than what I'm used to. Um, you know, I really when we talked about doing this podcast, which one was a was a big surprise for me. Like nobody came and said, "Hey, Cassie, we're gonna flip the microphone on you." But I'm happy to do it. But I was like, "Oh yeah, no problem." You know, we'll just we'll talk about the stuff I do every day. But it's a, it's surprisingly nerve wracking being on this side of the microphone. Oh my goodness. Well, you're gonna do great. I'm so excited. I can totally understand why you're nervous though, because I have been in that very position. Yes. It's I, I have a whole new appreciation for people on this side of the microphone. Like this is outside of my comfort zone. Interesting. Well, I'm glad that you you took the leap and joined me because I want to learn more about you and specifically your mobile business. I think that that is so um, courageous and just really interesting that you decided to take that on. So can you tell me a little bit about it? Yes. So um, first of all, fun legal semantics. So mm-hmm. in the state of Florida, I'm technically I'm a house call veterinarian rather than a mobile veterinarian, okay. which was something I had to learn when I was starting this practice because I'm um, OK. And, and anybody who if I get this wrong and anybody who knows I'm wrong, like, please don't attack me or anything. But <laughs> from what I understand, a mobile practice would be like if I had a unit that I took to people's houses and I took the pets into this unit and worked on them there. Okay. But I don't. I drive my SUV and I go to people's houses and I work on the pets inside of the house. So technically, I'm a house call veterinarian, um, which was something I had to learn when starting this up because there's a different set of rules and inspections and things like that, depending on which type of vet you are. It makes a lot of sense, though. Now I know. Yeah, I know. Like, who knew? So starting this mobile practice, it was born out of COVID, as so many things were, where Mm -hmm. when COVID happened and there was a lot of lockdowns, my kids were home from daycare and we really didn't have like a lot of resources for childcare at that point. I found myself uh, just without a practice and I was home uh, with my kids and I was very, very fortunate to be able to spend that time with them. But I had, I had a lot of like friends and family in the area. I've lived in the Gainesville area for next year will be 20 years. My husband's lived here his whole life. So I had a lot of friends and family that had come to see me and they were asking me questions about their pets and stuff. And I was like, you know, well, I don't, I don't have a practice. It's really hard for me to, to follow up with you guys. I'm going to have to send you here and there. Sure. 
So I started doing relief work and um, I was like, God love them. They were willing to like come see me at these different practices and stuff. And I was like, you guys are so amazing. But it it got really crazy because it was like, you know, on Tuesdays I'm here and on Thursdays I'm here and on, you know, Wednesday I'm somewhere in between and it changes every week and, and all of this. And so we were shipping records around and I knew the patients, but nobody at the practice did. And, and it was, it just got crazy. And so my husband was like, go, he's like, do a house call practice. And I said, you're crazy. I can't do a house call practice. I have no idea what I'm doing. He was incredibly encouraging and supportive and really gave me the confidence I needed to, to just get moving. Uh, There was a whole lot of steps involved in actually forming the practice, as you can imagine. But I mean, you have to start with step one, like you have to move forward on something. And I was very paralyzed and didn't, didn't feel confident that I could do any of it and therefore wasn't trying to. And so having his support to say, no, you can do this. Like, you're going to do a good job. You're going to, you know, I'll help you. And, and we're all here for you. Got, got the ball rolling. And then, you know, we talked to lawyers and accountants and, sure. and all of this stuff, which sounds a lot scarier than it is. It actually it was not as hard as I was making it out to be in my head got the ball rolling on this house call practice. It's a really small practice where mainly just the the same group of friends and family that I had Mm -hmm. been seeing their pets for years. Uh, And we, I like to think of it as like a pretty high touch practice uh, because it is friends and family. These are people I see and interact with on a regular basis. So I know a lot about them and a lot about their pets and um, we, we navigate some crazy stuff together. Well, I just love that. I think that that is something that a lot of veterinary professionals probably think about doing. You know, so many people want to be business owners and we're in a profession where there's sort of a path for that, but it's a hard leap to make. So I'm glad you were able to make it and that you had the support needed. I Yes. And I like, I, I really, I have to give them a lot of credit because it, you know, it's no picnic doing all of this stuff. And so having somebody standing behind you, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, a spouse or a parent or, uh, you know, your best friend or, or your kid or something like that. So having somebody standing behind you and saying, you can do it, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you had that. So let's get into um, specifics a little bit. Tell me, because I'm sure you have some um, crazy chaos that can happen with, all of the different hats that you wear. Um, what are some of the challenges of being an owner of a house call practice? Yeah. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> there, So there's a lot of things I'd like to do in my house call practice that I just have not had the time to really give it the dedicated focus that I'd like to. And, and that's challenging in and of itself to, you know, have this list of things you'd really like to accomplish and just not feel like you can't get to it. Sure. It's it's craziness all the time, and I'm I'm not advocating for this level of craziness. I would like to at some point like consolidate the craziness in my life. Mm-hmm. But um, so like you mentioned, wearing a lot of different hats. So I own this house call practice. Um, I also work for Vetfolio, and then I also do regular relief for an animal hospital here in the Gainesville and Newberry area. And they're great. Like they're an amazing support system because because being a house call veterinarian and not having like a unit with radiology and, and anesthesia and all these different things, we can really work hand in hand together and have a really great relationship. But it just means like somebody is needing my attention constantly. That's that right. feels like tooting my own horn, but it's, I promise it's not like, I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm I believe my it. Name. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna like, somebody's gonna say Cassie and I'm just like, gonna be like, not here. Nope. Not, not <laughs> uh, but yeah, between, you know, somebody, always having a question about something and, uh, you know, inclu- including my kids <laughs> and so, you know, they, right. they want attention too. And the way that things are set up, there's not a lot of redundancy in what I do. So if somebody is reaching out to me because they need the answer to something, there's not, I don't have a technician, I don't have a CSR and, or, you know, a practice manager and all these different things. So 
I, now a personal assistant. I would love to have a personal assistant one day. Oh, I don't think it's too. happening anytime soon. <laughs> there, you know, there's nobody I can refer them to and say like, oh, we'll ask so-and-so and they can get you the answer. There's nobody I can reach out to most of the time and say, hey, can you call so-and-so and tell them X, Y, and Z? Right. So I, that part's challenging. It makes it hard to unplug because if somebody has a question, it's not like, oh, if they have a question, they can't get a hold of me. They'll just call so-and-so. I will 100% admit that some of that pressure is completely manufactured in my head where I have very smart, responsible clients and and pet owners who, if they can't get a hold of me, they're very respectful of if I'm on vacation or if I'm at home with my kid who is sick and they know who to call and they know who to reach out to. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. It's me who's like, no, but I need to be there for you. And so some of that, some of that pressure is, is artificial. But, but it feels like that sometimes. So that's one of the challenges of, of just feeling like somebody needs me for something all the time and it waxes and wanes. It's not all the time. It's not always. Sure. And then the other part is like, I'm, I'm trained to practice medicine. I'm not trained to, to, I, I never went to business school or anything like that. So I'm learning a lot of this stuff as I go and I really hope I'm doing it all right. I'm really trying hard to make sure I am, but I mean, some, some lessons are, I learned the hard way. Yeah, I can imagine that that's the case. Do you have um, like a mentor or people you can reach out to if you need to? Absolutely. I, it's it's all about having good resources. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've talked to Eve Harrison on the podcast before who runs the House Call Vet Academy. She's an amazing resource. You know, I have an amazing accountant. My mom is my bookkeeper. God love nice. her. Like, she does a great job with that. So mentorships and then also just people to to reach out to to take some of some of the other responsibilities off of my shoulders. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You can't do it all alone. So I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about that. So I know you mentioned when you go on vacation and things like that, that your clients are very respectful. Um, what steps do you have to take to kind of maintain that work-life balance? It, it, I, I Actually, it hasn't been quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I do have a group of clients that are very respectful, probably because we do have that close personal relationship. And so they know that I have that desire to be there for them and to help. So when I say I have to unplug, it's too much. People, people tend to be very respectful of that, but I have in a couple cases had to set boundaries. And I will tell you, um, most of the time I end, if I'm setting a boundary, I'm having to do it on the back end because I'm not good at setting boundaries up front. And that is way harder to do. Yeah. So I would say, you know, learn from my mistakes when it comes to setting boundaries and have have an idea of what those boundaries are ahead of time and do your best to keep those in place and and not compromise your boundaries and then have to go back and reinforce them on the back Mm -hmm. end. With that being said, um, I also feel like having some flexibility in my boundaries is it really helps. So having a a group of really trusted clientele, I think helps in maintaining a work-life balance. And if it's not a fit, uh, uh, realizing that not everything is going to be a love connection. That's I don't true. get along with everybody. I don't, I don't think the moon and stars of every single person I meet. And so why should I think everybody is going to think the moon and stars of me if they meet me? Like just because we don't get along doesn't mean that there's there's anything wrong with me or there's anything wrong with this other person. It just means our goals, our priorities, our communication style, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. they're just not fitting together. And so being quick to say, this isn't a fit. uh, And with me having that alternative um, of a brick and mortar practice to say, you know, this isn't working, but I can see you in in a different capacity where there's a little bit more structure and redundancy. Sure. uh, I think that makes a big difference. But I mean, work work life balance. I I don't I don't even know if I like. Are you able to turn off like your clients? It seems like you have a really great relationship with them. But are you personally able to turn off when you're on that vacation or kind of working on something else? I I think I am able to turn off and um and again it comes from like family support. I think I look right. at you know my kids and my husband and I'm like they deserve this kind of attention too. And so let me I, it's a conscious effort. It's not something that comes naturally, but to say I'm going to put my phone down and I'm going to put my auto responder on so people know I'm not available. They have emergency resources and I'm going to go be with my family and I'm going to yeah. focus on them and give them my time and attention. That's important. What kind of freedom does being a house call practice owner give you? 
in terms of how you treat your patients, compromises that you can make with your owners? Like what kind of flexibility do you have? That is a good question. For me, it's been a double-edged sword because, gosh, especially with friends and family, right? Because you're having to look at people on a regular basis and and charge them money um, right. to care for their pet. And, you know, so many of the these owners and these pets I care about really deeply. I'm like, gosh, I would do anything to help your pet. But, I, you know, I have to look at it from a standpoint of it, it, the same thing we, that would apply to any veterinary practice if I can't keep seeing patients unless I get paid for it. Like I can't afford to take care of everybody's pets, uh, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So I have to get paid for that. And then also what, you know, to, to own a business, there's a lot of time and effort involved. And so if I'm taking time away from my family and my personal life, then I, you know, you need to get compensated for that because as much as I, do it because I love it. I I can't keep doing it forever just because I love it. You know, there's got to be some compensation. So I've gotten much better about it. It's become much easier to to put those charges in um, and, and do that. Um, I think also I've become more confident in my practice and how it works and the value that I provide to where it's, it's easier for me now to say like, I'm going to, you know, make sure and, and charge appropriately for what I'm doing because I, I understand that I'm more confident in the value that I'm providing. But with that being said, when I do just get like, you know, one of those, like those cases that just pulls on your heartstrings and you're like, gosh, I could fix this, but like you can't afford it. And it's going to take X, Y, and Z and all of this. You know, I also have the freedom to say this one, I'm going to fix this one. I'm going to take on because, and, and it's a personal choice and it's going to cost me, you know, whatever in my practice, but I'm going to make that choice and and go ahead and, and take care of this pet. So that's where I say like, it's a double-edged sword because I'd love to do that for every, every single pet that I treat because I'm a stereotypical veterinarian, <laughs> but, um, but it's nice to have that flexibility to be able to maybe treat some cases that. I, I'm, I don't know, you know, maybe I wouldn't have the flexibility in a different type of structure. The other thing that, that I've been able to do is to kind of try some stuff and not to say that you can't do this in, in a different type of practice. I think you absolutely can, but because of the, the personal relationships I have with my clients, it's, I, I have a lot of confidence in our conversations to where I'm thinking of like a palliative care case where I had a dog with disseminated mast cell disease and he was really doing poorly, had terrible ascites Mm -hmm. and was very uncomfortable. And we were absolutely talking euthanasia, but there was a family member who hadn't made it home to see this pup. And we were trying to just get him like, you know, 24 more hours. So this, this family member could say goodbye. And so we had to drain the ascites off of his belly and we ended up doing it on the pool deck because why not? You why know, not? Is, is, is the pool deck any better than going in the house? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we used a butterfly needle and, and gloves and the owner kind of sat there and pet him and you know, he was oh. a really good dog. And we just drained, I think we drained like over a liter out sure. just sitting on the pool deck. And, you know, like the, the daughter was there, like, you know, the tray would get full and we'd empty it out and go. And so we were, it was just, I was the only medical professional there. And then we just kind of worked together as a team to drain the ascites. And it, and it got this guy 24 more hours of, of pretty decent quality where he could say goodbye to the other family member and, um, and then we came and put him down the next day, but right. I didn't feel, you know, like if I didn't know that person and have that close personal relationship, I might not have felt so confident to say like, yes, we can do this. And like, you know, cause, cause you never know what can happen. Like something could go sideways, but I felt like they trusted me and I trusted them and that we could work together and we could get this done for this pet. And we ended up getting the outcome that we were, we were looking for. Wow. And I can also see how um, an, a dog in that condition, an owner might be reluctant to take them to the vet. Um, maybe they would have just elected euthanasia at that point to sort of avoid like discomfort. Yeah. So you coming out to the house, I think made that possible, you know, for that person to be able to say goodbye to their pet. Honestly, Sam, I never really thought about it, but you're right. Like this, this guy had just gotten discharged from a specialty facility. And so, yeah, if he, if he was really in that much pain, um, yeah, they probably wouldn't have elected to load him back up and drive him back to the specialty hospital, have his belly drain. They probably would have said like, no, he's suffering. You're just not going to make it to say bye to him. And we're going to have to put him down now. So I didn't really think about that, but that just kind of warmed my heart that you framed it that way. 
Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that that's the case probably with a lot of your cases is that you're um, like giving opportunities to these owners to sort of do things that are really stressful if you have to take a pet in. Like we had a dog growing up that had um, really bad osteoarthritis in his older years and taking him to the vet was like a nightmare for my parents. I think that you're giving owners a lot of opportunities by being able to give them that at-home care. So I love that. That makes me feel really good to hear you say that. And I think that's true, not just of, you know, my my tiny friends and family practice. I think that's true of a lot of house call medicine that, you know, being able to be there and provide that care for owners. So, you know, whether it's in-home euthanasia or primary care, or if, you ha- if you're a mobile vet and you, ha- you can provide everything, um, I-, I absolutely feel like being able to meet people where they are quite literally yeah um, rather than rather than just as a figure of speech makes uh it makes a big difference in terms of quality I just went out it was actually actually this week where I had an owner and she had seven animals and she worked really hard to take care of them but it was challenging because you have to load up two of them take them to the vet load up two of them take them to the vet and do and this would go on for weeks on end and of course mm-hmm. by the time she got everybody seen it was like start over again and uh, so I went out and I, I saw all the pets at once. And just the gratitude that comes out of these appointments were like, thank you. Oh, my gosh. This is like a huge relief that we were able to get this done. It really it's, it's nice to feel like you're, you're making a difference for people. Yeah, I love that so much. And I love that you have certain flexibility and things that you can kind of do that maybe you wouldn't be able to in a traditional practice setting. I think that that's something that a lot of veterinarians have probably thought, wow, I would love to be able to do more for this patient and, you know, have felt certain limitations. So that's really cool that you're able to uh, to sort of think outside the box sometimes and opportunities where maybe you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. And, and, you know, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because you have to be careful with which cases you're going to choose. And I, I by no means want to take away anything from my brick and mortar colleagues or, you know, people who who aren't business owners, whatever it may be. Uh, Because if there are limitations on what you're able to do and you don't have that flexibility, there's, there's a reason for that. And and there's a lot of reasons involved. You know, we have support staff and they need to get paid and, you know, we need to make sure we can keep the doors open. Whereas, you know, my situation is obviously much different from that. So, right. you know, I by no means want to say like, if you're, if you're limited, that that's not okay. Like there are, there are very valid reasons for that and, and very important reasons for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm I mean, limited too. Like I can't, yeah. I can't do it for everyone. <laughs> but it is very cool that you do get some it flexibility. So how does the relationship that you're able to build with owners enhance that care that you give? Well, kind of like I mentioned earlier, I think of my practice as like a a pretty high touch practice where I have these close relationships. So I tend to know a lot about uh, the relationship between an owner and their pet. Like, is this somebody who wants to pull up, pull out all the stops no matter what, or is this somebody who wants to start small and we'll work our way up and, and what kind of limitations we have. So I think that helps me with my recommendations to say, you know, oh, we've been in this situation in the past. And so, you know, maybe we, we approach something in a similar way. I also mentioned wearing a lot of hats and not always being able to get to somebody to, Mm -hmm. to see their pet. And actually this happened last week where I had an owner and I really, really wanted to be able to go out and see this pet and lay hands on her and get an idea of what was going on. But I had 18 other things going on and I just, I couldn't, and she right. needed me sooner than I could get to her. So I ended up sending the owner to an urgent care facility, but when they went, I could still talk on the phone. So that, oh my gosh, the vet at the urgent care facility was just fantastic. And like, they call, they called me from the exam room, which I gave them full permission to do. This was not like a breach of boundaries or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, they called me from the exam room. And so the owners were there and I was talking to the vet who did have hands on the dog. And, you know, again, I think the owners would have understood perfectly if I was like, I can't get to you, go talk to urgent vet. Let me know what happens. Don't call me because I'm in the middle of things, but it made me feel better to be able to provide that value to my clients to say, I can't get to you, but I'm still here for you. And you know, we, I can work with this vet and tell them what I know about, about your dog. Cause this dog happened to have a whole lot of concurrent conditions going on that it would have been hard to suss out if, especially if this, this poor urgent care vet had a lot going on at the time. Right. So I, it felt good that she was able to call me and I was able to explain all the comorbidities with this patient and what we were doing in medical jargon. 
And then the owners also got that value of having, you know, two vets weighing in on what was going on with their dog. And I hope the urgent care vet feels the same way, but I felt like we worked really well together and, and we, we combined what she was seeing and her knowledge of everything with, with, with what I knew of the patient and, and we were able to get some good, good results. Yeah, she was able to be of like your eyes and another person to sort of talk things over with. So that's awesome. I love, and I know you described it as um, like a low volume, high touch model. I love that you've been able to adopt that. I think that that has to be so rewarding. It is for me. It's not for everybody. You know, some sure. people don't want that kind of model, but for me, I, I really love it. Yeah. So it seems like um, veterinary medicine is, of course, a huge part of your identity, like it is for all of us. Do you feel okay with that? How do you sort of feel about that being such a big part of who you are? Sam, I'm so glad you asked that. I feel so <laughs> strongly about this. Oh, good. Yes. So yeah, vet med is a part of my identity and I'm okay with that. And and that is a choice I have made and that I, that it, with where I am in my life and, and the choices that I've made in my life thus far, yes, vet med is a huge part of my identity. Like when people ask me, if you ask me who I am, definitely describing myself as a veterinarian would be a huge part of that. We also talked a lot about setting boundaries, and I think that boundaries are important. I think all of us as individuals can really sit down and reflect on what kind of boundaries we want to have, and there's no one-size-fits-all model. Mm -hmm. So if you're the kind of person that says, vet med is my job, and I do it between the hours of 9 and 6 p.m., and then I go home and I, you know, my identity is, you know, I like to, to water ski. That's a whole story. I grew up water, like um, <laughs> competitively water skiing, um, or I like to, I'm a gamer or, you know, I like to go hiking. I have a technician who's really passionate about rock climbing and, and oh my that, gosh. you know, she's amazing at it. And that's your identity and it's not vet med, that's okay. You know, you can draw those boundaries. And if you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, like me, where you're like, I eat, sleep and breathe vet med and I love it so much and I just can't get enough of it. Yeah. Uh, that's okay too. Or somewhere in the middle. So that, I think that is what, at least at this point in my life, I, and I reserve the right to change my opinion, Yeah. but it, where I am in my life right now, I feel like we can all kind of choose how much of our identity we want to be wrapped up in vet med and whatever, wherever you fall along that spectrum is fine, is, is your choice. And as, if you're comfortable with it, then it's okay. I love that. I love listening to that intuition and sort of just going with it because I think that we're all encouraged, of course, to like, you know, have our lives outside of work, have different hobbies, you know, different things that you know, are important. And of course that is important. And I think it's really well-intentioned, but sometimes um, maybe people are maybe feeling a little guilty because they are so invested in their work and they shouldn't be. I could not agree more. I could not agree more that if, you know, you be as wrapped up as you want to be. And if you're getting too wrapped up in it and you need to take a few steps back, like so it's really a lot harder to set boundaries on the back end, but it can be done. Uh, so yeah, just exactly. Like, you know, just be, give yourself grace to be who you are. I mean, yeah. isn't that like the message of just life these days? Like, you know, be okay. Be okay with that. Absolutely. Listening to that inner voice and kind of following it. Yeah. I love that. So juggling working on your business, mom life, being the only veterinarian um, in your practice, of course, I'm sure is really challenging. Uh, we talked about how sometimes working on your business gets put on the back burner. What recommendations do you have for people that also struggle with prioritizing? Like you said, you're like, I'm a veterinarian. I didn't go to business school. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, business owners and vet med are in that same boat. So do you have any recommendations for people that um, need to start prioritizing their business model a little bit more or are interested in starting a business? I don't know if my advice is the advice you want to take. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I do an amazing job at it. I have a colleague who um, he just opened a practice in Georgia and he went and got his MBA uh, before opening this practice. And he is just like a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so if you want somebody to model your uh, the business aspect of your practice, I, I will. I would absolutely recommend him, not me. Um, however, I, I got really passionate about learning as much as I could about business ownership as much as I can, cause it's still a process 
about business ownership. And I think I've read like only nonfiction books for two years now, wow. maybe longer. And so concepts that are introduced in, in books like E-Myth, you know, m- taking the time to work on your business, not just in your business and things mm-hmm. like that are so important. So am, am I understanding your question, right? Like the question is about prioritizing the business aspect of it because that is as important as the medicine. Yeah. And just any yeah. recommendations you have in terms of books or, you know, people to follow on social media or anything like that. Absolutely. Well, yes. So um, I, yeah, I would say the the nonfiction books, I think were a big deal for me in the business books and really learning about different business concepts for me, because I'm a house call vet, I drive a lot. And so I spend a lot of that time listening to some of these books and incorporating the concepts. A lot of them for me, I find like I have to listen to them two or three times before anything is really driven home for me, but Mm -hmm. just, it's, it's just, it's like anything else. It's like practicing medicine. It's just, it's a work in progress. And as you, as you learn more, you do more and you do better. And so like I said, I don't know if my, my advice is the best, um, because I'm still, I am still working quite hard on it, but, um, but yeah, just learn as much as you can go slow, be patient and, um, and do the best you can. I love that. I think that's really sound advice. Cassie, I think that your patients and your clients are so lucky to have you. I'm so glad that you started this adventure. I think that you're phenomenal at it and that you're only going to get better. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so glad we were able to have this discussion. Sam, me too. Thank you so much for flipping the script on me. Like that's <laughs> more nerve wracking than I thought it was going to be. Hopefully I didn't put my foot in my mouth, but, but your insight into, um, you know, some of the things that I do has been really valuable. I'm so glad we sat down and had this conversation because you framed things um, in ways that I had never thought of. So thank you so much. Thanks. I learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was so much fun. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Vetfolio Voice. And now I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Cassie to wrap it up. Sam, thank you so much. I have a whole new appreciation for the folks on the other side of the table when we're doing these interviews. What an experience. For more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.